Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Gupta. Thank you for all the work that you do. Um, it's so nice to see everyone here. I'm, I met your new head of the Office of Recovery in the security line. I can tell you he's excited and ready to go. So, <laughs> a deputy, I'm sorry, you're right. But see, I just gave you a promotion. Um, let me, um, because I don't know everybody in the room, let me just get a sense of who everyone is here. I know sort of the categories of people who are here, but how many students do we have here? And how many people who are running or working in recovery programs? I know there's some overlap here. Um, how many CEOs and staff from companies that are working with your employees? And I know we have a few policymakers. Thank you. Did I miss anybody? You need you, I, I put you in the CEO category. Come on. Thank you all very much for being here. I, I'm so pleased to be invited to join you today. Um, and as Dr. Gupta said, um, sadly, New Hampshire, like West Virginia, was one of the states hit the earliest by the opioid epidemic. Um, I think it's fair to say that everybody I know in New Hampshire knows someone or a family who has been affected um, by substance misuse. Recently, I visited a women-owned and operated recovery support facility, and um, actually, facility is the wrong word because it's really a home, um, called Hope on Haven Hill, which is in Rochester, New Hampshire. It's about a half an hour from where I live in the state, and so I've been able to see that it's one of the places in our state that's been very hard hit. But what Hope on ha Haven Hill does is support women seeking recovery and women um, with small children or pregnant women. And they provide support for the women, and I use the term support uh, deliberately, as all of you know, um, because they offer a range of substance um, use disorder treatment and mental health services. And the women who are running this facility realized very early on that no amount of medication-assisted treatment um, could cure unstable housing, abusive households, or hunger. And they realize that real recovery depends on feeling control over one's choices um, and having some agency over our own lives. So they took it upon themselves to treat their patients as whole individuals, not just to treat the illness. Hope on Haven Hill now offers housing to every woman and their dependent who needs it, um, who's part of their program. They offer transportation to and from appointments. They bring outside providers into the facility so that women receiving treatment can get multiple medical appointments in the same day. They provide domestic violence services and counseling. They offer food assistance, career training. They even have a store where women can choose their own clothes instead of receiving donations. And it's these small but very important choices that are made possible by that amazing team at Hope on Haven Hill and other recovery programs like it that really lead to long-term stability and long-term recovery. You all um, in this room know this. But we have to be holistic about how we handle recovery. And so I'm pleased that that's why I wanted to know who everybody is, because today's discussion includes not just those in recovery and providers, but it includes employers. Um, no two patients are the same. Each need and deserve unique support that goes well beyond um, the disease of addiction. And that really leads me to the last point that I want to make, because what we need at the federal, state, and local levels, and in terms of support for recovery services and for treatment, is flexibility 
flexibility to meet the needs of patients, to meet the needs of communities, and to address the evolving crisis. Now, in New Hampshire, we made some real progress before COVID, and we were seeing rates of um, substance misuse decline. We were seeing overdoses st stabilize. Um, but of course, um, the, the pandemic um, changed that, and we saw the numbers begin to go back up. Um, but that's why the state opioid response grant program the work of ONDCP, so many of the efforts that are being done by the administration are so critical. Um, we know through um, the state opioid response grants in New Hampshire, we've been able to provide naloxone or Narcan to every EMT, police um, officer, firefighter, um, libraries, community workers, and that has made a huge difference. Um, the, Overdose death rates are beginning to stabilize again, um, but as we know, those overdose deaths aren't the answer. Um, getting those numbers down are critical, but we've also got to deal with the underlying recovery, and that's what this discussion today is all about. Um, we also realize that, at least in New Hampshire, we were seeing not just opioids, um, fentanyl, obviously, but also a rise in methamphetamine, a rise in cocaine, and the programs that we had tried to put in place in Washington weren't flexible enough to address that. So we've got to be able to make changes a lot faster than we've been able to in the past. Um, obviously, we've adapted the programs, but there's more work that needs to be done. And of course, housing, as we all know, is so critical. And right now, we have a housing crisis in this country. It's particularly acute in New Hampshire. And unfortunately, HUD's program to try and help with recovery housing receives only $30 million each year, and only half of the states are eligible each year. So it's past time we lift up those vital programs, and that's what we've been, what I've been working on in the Senate, and so many of my colleagues have been working on. And I'm pleased that this is an issue that has bipartisan support in Congress. Um, we know that to be successful, we've got to work together. And hopefully, we can work together to keep the government open so that what you're depending on is going to continue to be there. But last, just let me um, comment, because one of the other things we've seen in New Hampshire is a rise in xylazine, um, which is being used now to, be, to mix with pills and fentanyl. And as we know, Narcan doesn't work on xylazine. Um, and while NIH and the office of um, Dr. Valco and the office that's researching um, how do we address uh, substance issues is doing great work, they don't have an answer yet for xylazine. And what we've seen in New Hampshire is that mortality rates from xylazine have risen three times in the last year. So. Um, it's a challenge that we've got to continue to address. And I am so pleased that we have an administration that understands that we've all got to work together, that um, there is not one silver bullet solution, and especially appreciate Dr. Gupta and the work that you are doing, the work that SAMHSA is doing um, to ensure that we do work together to address this scourge and make a difference for the people of this country. So let me now turn it over to Dr. Delphin Rittman, and um, thank you for what you're doing in your role at SAMHSA.